Welcome back to Intro to Cultural Anthropology with Dr. Angela Montague. Today we will look at class and inequality. In this chapter and lecture, we will examine the related concepts of class and inequality. You've likely heard the term class many times before. Politicians frequently invoke class, most notably by stating their adamant support of the middle class. In the United States, middle class is synonymous with an idea of a comfortable living. It is synonymous with the idea that you can make enough money to afford a decent house, good food. Also, that you may have and enjoy some leisure time and maybe even an occasional vacation. What politicians are less comfortable talking about is that if there is a middle class, there must also be a lower class and an upper class. In short, there are people who cannot afford a comfortable life, and there are people who earn far more money than is necessary for a comfortable life. Class is more than simply making more or less money than others. Anthropologists define class as a system of power based on wealth, income, and social status that creates an unequal distribution of resources. Differential access to wealth, income, and social status ultimately results in some people having more power. This does not have to be nefarious or manipulative, but it is part of our cultural structure. For example, Imagine you wanted someone else's opinion on who to vote for in the next election. Who would you ask? Would you ask the opinion of a homeless person? How about the opinion of a garbage truck driver? What about the opinion of a local business owner or the opinion of a newspaper editor? We make assumptions about people based on their perceived class. Thus, class, or the appearance of class, becomes a significant factor in our daily lives. Over the course of this lecture, we will examine several questions surrounding class and inequality from your reading, including, is inequality a natural part of human culture? How do anthropologists analyze class and inequality? How are class and inequality constructed in the United States? What are the roots of poverty in the United States? Why are class and inequality invisible in U.S. culture? What is caste and how are caste and class related? What are the effects of global inequality? Is inequality a natural part of human culture? Virtually everywhere we look today, we can find some form of inequality. Thus, it is natural to ask if inequality is an inherent part of the human experience. Alternatively, is inequality simply the natural state of human beings? While some degree of achieved status is found in most cultures, anthropologists would argue that in fact, the extreme forms of class and inequality that we see today are a very recent addition to the human story. Human beings as a species have existed for approximately 150,000 years. Until quite recently, all human cultures were restic restricted to hunting and gathering as a means of subsistence. Due to the transient nature of hunters and gatherers, it's very hard to accumulate any form of wealth. If you are regularly moving, it is very difficult to build up a surplus of any economic good. Even extra income, in effect food, does you relatively little good. You can't carry around a refrigerator, for instance. Anthropologists have found that most hunter-gatherer cultures operate as egalitarian societies. Egalitarian societies share economic resources to ensure group success. They are a group based on the sharing of resources to ensure success with a relative absence of hierarchy and violence. Meat captured during the hunt or plants that are gathered are shared throughout the group. Access to raw materials such as stone-for-stone -stone tools, etc., are likewise shared. In this way, if a hunt fails, or if the group of gatherers find the local crop has been picked over by birds or other animals, group members can share their resources, ensuring everyone's survival. This kind of sharing is what anthropologists term reciprocity. Group members will share with those in need, anticipating that in the future someone will help them out too. To a certain degree, we can find reciprocity throughout human societies. The famous anthropologist Marcel Maus examined this issue in his book The Gift. Maus found that gifts were rarely given in a spirit of complete generosity, but rather that gifts create reciprocal relationships. For example, if a friend buys you a birthday present, you may find that you feel obligated to buy a present for your friend when their birthday comes around. Or, if a friend gives you a ride one day, you may want to later buy them a drink as a sign of thanks. Reciprocity has the benefit of creating relationships. 
Once someone does something for you, you are indebted to do something for them. These simple relationships go a long way to building an egalitarian economic structure. Egalitarian societies tend to have limited social hierarchies. Some individual may garner the respect of their fellow group members, perhaps because they are a particularly good hunter or a particularly skilled negotiator when social conflicts arise. This is typically referred to as achieved status. People have achieved their status through demonstrated skills. In contrast, egalitarian societies do not include ascribed status. Ascribed status is the anthropological term for when a person is born into their status. The son of a king must be treated differently from other children, even if he has not yet achieved any personal status. Over the history of our entire species, right, from 150,000 years ago to the present, most humans have lived in egalitarian societies. Thus, the forms of class and inequality that we see today are not the historical norm. Ranked societies have developed more recently. These are societies where some forms of prestige and status are stratified into set classes. Some people have greater access to prestige than others. Typically, economic wealth still remains relatively egalitarian within these societies. Ranked societies usually include positions of leadership, often referred to as chiefs. Chiefs enjoy greater access to economic staples, such as good quality food and shelter. In complex chiefdoms, they may enjoy access to luxury goods. In return, chiefs oversee social and political matters for the culture. Often they are also viewed as a religious figure with greater access to the divine. In order to maintain their position, chiefs typically make use of systems of redistribution. Redistribution involves the chief giving out gifts to the members of the chiefdom. These gifts may range from ritual or prestigious items to basic staples of life like food and shelter. The system is referred to as redistribution because these items often first came from the people when they gave them to the chief. Farmers may be required to give all of their produce to a chief, but then the chief will return some of that food to the farmers along with other goods that farmers did not produce, such as pottery or tools made by other specialists. Potlatch is an elaborate redistribution ceremony in the Pacific Northwest. Redistributive economies can be highly complex. Despite the modern connotation of the term, redistribution often did not involve everyone receiving an equal share. One of the most famous examples of redistribution in modern anthropology is the potlatch ceremony observed by Franz Boas. While studying the Quakutal culture in the Pacific Northwest, Boaz observed that chiefs threw enormous feasts known as potlatches where they brought large quantities of food. They also brought gifts of blankets and other goods for people in attendance, including gifts for neighboring chiefs. Boaz noted that potlatches kept growing larger and larger with chiefs bringing more and more to the party. Sometimes there were so many goods that a chief would have them destroyed instead of giving them away. You can think of this as a type of conspicuous consumption. For example, throwing a wine glass into a fire after finishing your drink. The glass is so cheap to you that you can afford to publicly destroy it rather than reuse it. Boaz was able to demonstrate that chiefs earned their social standing through these potlatch uh, feasts. The more goods a chief could bring to the party, the more highly he was regarded. As each chief gained prestige, their neighbors wanted to outdo them, so they would attempt to hold even larger feasts. This example of redistribution has become a classic example in anthropology. Ranked societies may be less common in overall human history, but there does seem to be a common desire among humans to develop ranked and status-driven behavior among our cultures. How do anthropologists analyze class and inequality? We will now take a look at four different scholars and their approach to class and inequality so that we can come to a better understanding of these phenomena. Many scholars have had profound effects on the modern world. Take Karl Marx, for example. Whether you agree or disagree with Marx's analyses, he has had a tremendous impact on the world. Marx and his writings on class were deeply influenced by the unusual period of time during which he lived. Marx was born in 1801 and began his observations on class and inequality in the early 1800s. During this period, the Industrial Revolution was coming to its height. All across Europe, factories were beginning to provide the majority of jobs. 
Prior to the Industrial Revolution, a majority of jobs, jobs were found in agriculture. This transition had never before occurred in human history. As factories grew in size, conditions for the work often became more and more miserable. Work shifts could be as long as 12 to 16 hours, and little in the way of breaks were provided. Child labor was rampant, and safety standards in factories were extremely low. These working conditions inspired not only Marx's scholarship, but his subsequent pol political activism. He authored the, the Communist Manifesto, as many of you probably know. Marx's analysis of class and inequality in 19th century Europe identified two principal classes in European culture, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie can be glossed as the upper class, um, but more importantly, Marx identified the bourgeoisie as the owners of the means of production. For Marx, the means of production referred to everything from land to factories, machines to raw materials. It included all of the materials and machines needed to produce goods for sale. The proletariat can, in contrast, be glossed as the working class. The, the members of the proletariat did not own any of the means of production. The only thing they could offer to the economy was their own labor. In short, these were the factory workers that Marx saw living under horrendous working conditions for minimal pay. The existence of these two extremes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, in any capitalist economy is a well-accepted fact. However, there can be an enormous gray area between these extremes, particularly in modern capitalism, which is considerably more complicated than early 19th century capitalism. Today, there exists a broad realm of middle management, you know, people who have considerably more power than the proletariat, but still do not officially own the means of production. Marx's analysis, however, finds its strength in simplicity rather than in precise detail. By examining the large picture, he was able to inspire generations of scholars. Marx's scholarship, however, became more controversial when he began to suggest, that, suggest what should be done about the inequality he observed. Together with uh, Engels, Marx authored the Communist Manifesto, which advocated for the organization of workers to resist the demands of the bourgeoisie and called for an enforced form of economic egalitarianism. This doctrine was hugely influential around the world and inspired many revolutions. Today, however, most of these revolutions have failed. This failure is at least in part of uh, the result of some oversimplification of economies um, made by Marx. However, it is still a useful analysis for, for looking at class and inequality, as well as some of the um, issues with capitalism globally. Max Weber was an economist working in the second half of the 19th century. He dealt with a more firmly established industrialism than Marx had seen. Weber was particularly interested in the topics of prestige and life chances. Prestige was the simple notion that certain classes of people had greater prestige than others. Um, that is, they were more highly regarded by their fellows. Uh, a classic example would be a doctor and a farmer. Doctors are typically regarded as more important in a culture, despite the fact that we would all starve without farmers. We see similar prestige distinctions between many career choices. Used car salesman versus a clothing retailer, or a garbage truck driver versus a limo driver. Weber argued that prestige had a major impact on a person's life. That is, even if a doctor and a farmer made the same amount of money, a doctor would still have more cultural influence. Weber was also concerned with how class and prestige affected life chances. Quite simply, your class and your relative prestige affects the opportunities you may have in life. The children of the working class, for example, have a very limited chance to enter a top-tier university such as a modern Harvard or Yale. However, children of the bourgeoisie have a much easier time getting into these schools. They receive a different class of education and training from a young age that prepares them to pass the entrance exams. Thus, Weber noted that class and inequality were influenced by more than simple access to the means of production. Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu was a French philosopher working in the last half of the 19th century. Thus, he lived in a world that had worked past the rough early days of industrialization that had defined Marx's and Weber's point of view. Um, 
Earlier in his career, Bourdieu was particularly interested in studying education and social mobility. In many Western cultures, education has long been seen as the gateway to social mobility. If you study hard and succeed at school, it can open the gates to a good job with more money. Thus, you will have an ability to move up to a higher, more influential class. While there are individual examples of just such a phenomenon, Bourdieu found that it was the exception rather than the rule. That is, very few people actually changed their class via educational success. Instead, Bourdieu observed more social reproduction than social mobility. By social reproduction, we mean that children became a part of the same class as their parents. Thus, the class was simply being reproduced. Bourdieu proposed two key factors as the, as the causes of social reproduction, habitus and cultural capital. Habitus can be a tad confusing at times, but it really doesn't have to be. Habitus refers to both a person's and a group's self-perception or identity that develops as part of enculturation. As you learn about the world and your own culture, you develop ideas about how you fit into the world. Are you proud to come from a hard-working blue-collar family? Do you think your hometown was a run-down backwater that you were happy to escape? These experiences affect how you view yourself and your class status. While self-perception and identity are inherently individual, they can also form shared norms. Certain cities and towns are known for their, quote, personality. New Yorkers are often called rude and abrasive, for example. These stereotypes are formed, in part, based on shared self-perceptions, or shared habitus. Habitus is Latin for habit. Bourdieu coined, coined the term to suggest that self-perceptions become habits that are difficult to break. If we perceive ourselves as belonging to a certain class, it is unlikely that we will ever break away from that class. Thus, social reproduction becomes the norm. Bourdieu also saw cultural capital as reinforcing social reproduction. Cultural capital refers to what resources you and your family have to draw upon. By being born into a family, you are born into a base of cultural capital. If your family has access to wealth, they can send you to better schools or provide more enrichment activities for you. Or, if your family has high social standing within a community, some part of that social standing will be transferred to you. Thus, if you are the child of a local politician, more people will know who you are and be willing to assist you in a time of need. Our inheritance of cultural capital affects our abilities to change our class standing. Bourdieu's notion of cultural capital is very similar to Weber's notion of life chances. Social reproduction becomes a norm simply because the cultural capital we have access to does not elevate our situation. For our final theorist, we want to look at the work of anthropologist Leith Mullings. Following the holistic traditions of an anthropology, Mullings argues that in order to understand class and inequality, we must use what she terms an intersectional approach. Intersectionality is an analytical framework for addressing how factors such as class, race, and gender interact to shape individual life chances and social patterns of stratification. So she argues that to understand class and inequality, we must look at how class intersects with um, race and gender. As we see uh, in uh, previous chapters, both race and gender are pretty significant factors in the attainment of cultural power. They, are both, uh, they both logically intersect with class status. Mulling's interest in these topics arose out of her work with the Harlem Birthright Project. At the time of her study, Harlem was an economically vibrant African-American community in New York. Despite being a prosperous community, however, infant mortality rates were twice as high as those in the rest of New York City. Thus, while families were financially prosperous, babies were still dying at twice the rate of other families in the area. Mullings and her team conducted extensive interviews and studies of local living conditions. In the end, their conclusions suggested that the institutional and pers uh, personal prejudices faced by African-American women took an undue toll on the health of infants. Thus, class as a concept of social standing cannot be solely examined from an economic perspective. Race and gender were inextricable factors in the larger picture of the lives of Harlem residents. 
How are class and inequality constructed in the United States? As we discussed at the beginning of this chapter, Americans have a tendency to view themselves as part of a classless society. It is part of the American national ideology to think that anyone can succeed and advance by their own merit. This is called a meritocracy. It's the idea that you will be compensated based on your merit. According to the ideology, uh, ideology of the American dream, America is the land of limitless opportunity in which individuals can go as far as their own merit takes them. They can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, so to speak. But ideologies do not always match realities. As we also said beforehand, if there is a middle class, then there is also an upper class and a lower class. We want to take this section to look at how class and inequality are constructed in the United States. First, we will look at some of the numbers, i.e. the distribution of income and wealth in the United States. Then we will look at um, some ethnographic case studies. Let's um, first look at income. Income is defined as money earned from salaries as well as investments such as interest, dividends, etc. In 2010, median, i.e. average, household income in the United States was approximately $50,000 a year. Of all income earned in 2010, 21.3% went to 5% of the U.S. population, i.e. the highest earning 5%. Uh, in contrast, 3.3% of all income earned in 2010 went to the lowest earning 20% of the population. In all, more than 50% of income earned in 2010 went to just 20% of the population. Half of all the income earned went to just 20% of the people. Income disparity between the upper class and the lower class has also been growing. If we compare the income distribution of 2010 with the income distribution of 1967, the top earners are making more money while all other groups are making comparatively less money. This trajectory of income disparity has been increasing for many decades now. Now let's look at wealth. Wealth is defined not by money brought in each year, i.e. income, but instead on goods owned, such as real estate, stocks, bonds, etc., anything you own that is worth significant money. The distribution of wealth in the United States is even more heavily skewed than income. From a 2009 survey, 35.6% of the nation's wealth is controlled by just 1% of the population. In contrast, 80% of the population controlled just 12.8% of the nation's wealth. Thus, the uh, remaining 19% controlled 51.6% of the nation's wealth. Um, while just over 50% of all income in 2010 went to 20% of the population, 87.2% of the nation's wealth is controlled by 20% of the population. Therefore, wealth is more disproportionately controlled by the upper class than income. Access to wealth, even more than income, has a greater effect on issues of prestige, habitus, and life chances. In short, wealth creates opportunity. The disproportionate access to wealth creates disproportionate access to cultural power and influence. While the United States perhaps offers greater opportunities for equality than other countries have in the past, it is still far from a classless society. Let's turn now to ethnographic portraits of class in the United States. In her ethnography, Worked to the Bone, Race, Class, Power, and Privilege in Kentucky, Anthropologist Pem Davidson Buck shared her experiences living and working among poor whites in rural Kentucky. Buck lived with her husband for 12 years in Kentucky. Um, when moving to the area, they were able to buy a piece of land, and then they tried to live off of that land. They found, however, that living off subsistence agriculture was not possible, and they both had to have jobs on the side. Throughout this experience, they interacted with class, race, and power. Many of the region's inhabitants were poor whites. These people and their ancestors had been beguiled into the region with the promise of good jobs in tobacco cultivation, coal mining, and manufacturing, but in reality, most of the profits went to business owners. Buck found that many of the poor whites of Kentucky experienced not only class discrimination, but also racial discrimination. Redneck or white trash status became a form of racial classification, a classification which carried many prejudices. 
Buck's research is a good reminder that while white privilege and institutional racism is a powerful force in modern America, not all whites receive positive benefits from their racial status. Downward mobility, the middle class and the working poor. The American narrative of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps reinforces an idea that we are responsible for our fate and thus downplays any possible existence of structural failings such as, a, as lack of good jobs or structural racism that prevents certain people from getting good jobs. Anthropologist Catherine Newman has been studying middle class families and the working poor. Her findings have challenged the idea of meritocracy. That is, she challenges the idea that those who work hard succeed and those who fail are lazy. She found many people who were hardworking and educated who lost their jobs as factories shipped jobs overseas or whose jobs were replaced by automation. While these people could look for new jobs, their resumes only qualified them for jobs that no longer existed. While many Americans think that urban poverty is the result of a lack of work ethic or dependency on welfare, Newman found the opposite. She found people working hard for their families, seeking any way out of their situation that they could find. Americans have heavily invested in the idea of meritocracy. But while it is difficult to succeed without hard work, hard work is also not always enough. Finally, we look at an example not of lower classes, but of the upper classes. Most anthropologists have studied marginal cultures, either people who are living in remote and isolated communities or people who are isolated from a culture's most powerful institutions. Recently, however, more and more anthropologists have begun to also study the powerful members of a culture. In her 2008 ethnography of Wall Street, Karen Ho examined the cultural life of Wall Street's most powerful. Ho spent several years in the 1990s working with a large Wall Street investment bank. She found a culture that favored money at all costs. Most notably, uh, Ho examined the prevalence of layoffs and firings in large companies that were experiencing record profits. If a company was making record profits, she asked why they would be firing employees. She found that the practice was largely influenced by stock values. When companies laid, laid off workers, they were perceived as streamlining. As a result, their stock value would go up, and investment banks made more money. These positive reinforcements only encouraged companies to let go even more employees. Ho argued that this culture of profit ultimately led to the 2008 financial collapse. Many banks began engaging in risky trades and mortgages. These, these investments offered the possibility of high, short-term financial returns. Thus, they were favored by the culture of profit. But these investments were unstable in the long run, eventually leading to a financial collapse. A culture of financial profit can be as unshakable as a culture of hard work. While the working poor in Kentucky or in urban environments value work, they are isolated from economic opportunities that would allow them to profit from that work. Investment bankers on Wall Street, however, were surrounded by that very power, and instead of making decisions based on long-term stability, they emphasized a culture of profit that made them very rich in the short term, but did tremendous damage in the long run. What are the roots of poverty in the United States? The culture of poverty is the idea that those who are poor have adopted a culture that ensures the continuation of that poverty. That is, people become lazy or dependent on government assistance, and they are thus unable to break out of poverty. The idea of a culture of poverty comes from an anthropological study by Oscar Lewis. Lewis carried out ethnographic work in both Mexico and the United States among poverty-stricken populations. He suggested that certain patterns of thought and views of the world developed among the poor and that these patterns of thought actively reinforced poverty itself. For example, Lewis argued that children who grew up poor often learned patterns of marginality and dependency and that they continued these patterns in adulthood. This concept of a developed worldview is very similar to Bourdieu's idea of habitus. The world we grow up in affects the views we build of ourselves. Thus, growing up in poverty will certainly have an impact on an individual. Lewis's work on the culture of poverty was primarily meant for an academic audience. He was writing for other anthropologists about cultural problems. But United States politicians and policymakers became attracted to the notion of a culture of poverty. 
U.S. government officials had an interest in poverty and research on the subject. They were seeking to find ways to craft government po policy on the subject. While Lewis's work on the culture of poverty was not well received by anthropologists, it was well received by the government. In short, it suggested the problem of poverty was not the government's fault, but instead it was the fault of the poor themselves. The idea of a culture of poverty was most influentially applied in a report written by uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan for the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. In his report, quote, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, end quote, end quote Moynihan attempted to explain African American poverty as a result of African American culture. He argued that institutional racism, Jim Crow, and segregational, uh, segregation laws were not a primary fault, but instead that poverty was culturally created. Needless to say, not everyone agreed with Moynihan's assessment, and uh, it's been pretty much debunked. Partially in response to Moynihan's report, many scholars and public policymakers began to look at poverty as a problem of structural inequality. For example, if we look at infrastructure, if poor communities have inadequate education systems, i.e. not enough schools and poor quality teachers, or if they have inadequate access to health care, i.e. doctors and hospitals, or if the jobs that are available in poor neighborhoods do not pay a living wage, or if police protection is minimally applied, we may ask, how much does a person's attitude toward hard work matter? That is, even if you work hard and try to lift yourself out of poverty, can you do it if there are no steps to climb up? Poor neighborhoods in the United States have also been disproportionately affected by the forces of globalization. As stated previously, many factory jobs that provided thousands of Americans with a living wage no longer exist. With the growing forces of globalization, many of these factories have moved overseas where they can pay workers far less or avoid higher tax rates and thus achieve a higher profit margin on their goods. With these jobs um, leaving the United States, an important sector of the manufacturing economy has been decimated. If we compare this to the culture of poverty concept, who is more to blame for the state of poverty? The person who is now unemployed or the company that sent the job overseas? But it is important to note that structural inequalities alone cannot fully explain poverty. We have all met people who work hard, and we have met people who are a bit more on the lazy side. How do we account for both factors when we discuss poverty? Why are class and inequality largely invisible in U.S. culture? Your chapter opens with just such an example from the Baltimore, Baltimore Orioles baseball team. What looks like a simple baseball game is actually a field full of class differences. Even among the players, there is tremendous variability in income. The highest paid player made $13 million a year, while many other players made $507,000 a year. $507,000 is still a very good salary in America, but the highest paid player makes almost 30 times as much money every year as his teammates. When you go to a game, there are examples of class inequality all around you, but that is usually not what you first think about. Instead, we focus on the game, or even the collective experience of watching the game with a group of people. When class and inequality are rampant throughout the United States, why are they largely invisible? There are many possible contributing factors. Today we will focus on just two, the role of the media and voluntary isolation. The role of the media. Media has a powerful ability to influence our cultural perceptions. On average, U.S. residents watch 28 hours of television each week, and that's just television. Americans also come into contact with newspapers, printed ads, the internet, and many other media outlets on a regular basis. The media has an extremely powerful influence on how we view poverty, as well as class and inequality. Think of all the sitcoms you have seen in your life. So question, how are rich people portrayed in sitcoms? How are poor people portrayed in sitcoms? What do these portrayals say about class and inequality? The push for the middle class in the, in the United States is pretty common. Everyone wants to be middle class. We don't necessarily want to admit if we are rich and we certainly don't want to be poor. There's also voluntary isolation. 
Anthropologist Saitha Lowe um, explores another way in which class is made invisible in her book Behind the Gates. Increasingly over the years, members of the upper class and even the upper middle class have been moving to gated communities. In these communities, the outside world is kept at bay. Only other residents or approved guests may enter. Sometimes even the mail and package delivery has to be left at the gate. This is a form of voluntary isolation. That is, removing oneself from the possibility of interacting with other classes. When in isolation, it is easy to forget about the rest of the world. While the popularity of gated communities is somewhat new in the United States, the idea of voluntary isolation is not. For the past 60 years or more, the United States has, has seen tremendous growth in suburban development. Starting in the 1950s and 1960s, middle class, largely white families began to move out of the big cities in favor of living in the surrounding suburbs. This transition was fueled by a booming economy which allowed many people to afford new homes, as well as cars and gas for a commute to work back in the city. In effect, however, the suburban migration created isolation between middle-class suburbanites and inner-city poor. Both gated communities and suburban communities have gone a long way toward helping middle-class Americans isolate themselves from issues of class and inequality that they did not want to deal with. The role of the media. Media has a powerful ability to influence our cultural perceptions. On average, U.S. residents watch 28 hours of television each week, and that's just television. Americans also come into contact with newspapers, printed ads, the internet, and many other media outlets on a regular basis. The media has an extremely powerful influence on how we view poverty, as well as class and inequality. Think of all the sitcoms you have seen in your life. So question, how are rich people portrayed in sitcoms? How are poor people portrayed in sitcoms? What do these portrayals say about class and inequality? The push for the middle class in the, in the United States is pretty common. Everyone wants to be middle class. We don't necessarily want to admit if we are rich, and we certainly don't want to be poor. There's also voluntary isolation. Anthropologist Saitha Lowe um, explores another way in which class is made invisible in her book Behind the Gates. Increasingly over the years, members of the upper class and even the upper middle class have been moving to gated communities. In these communities, the outside world is kept at bay. Only other residents or approved guests may enter. Sometimes even the mail and package delivery has to be left at the gate. This is a form of voluntary isolation. That is, removing oneself from the possibility of interacting with other classes. When in isolation, it is easy to forget about the rest of the world. While the popularity of gated communities is somewhat new in the United States, the idea of voluntary isolation is not. For the past 60 years or more, the United States has, has seen tremendous growth in suburban development. Starting in the 1950s and 1960s, middle class, largely white families began to move out of the big cities in favor of living in the surrounding suburbs. This transition was fueled by a booming economy which allowed many people to afford new homes, as well as cars and gas for a commute to work back in the city. In effect, however, the suburban migration created isolation between middle-class suburbanites and inner-city poor. Both gated communities and suburban communities have gone a long way toward helping middle-class Americans isolate themselves from issues of class and inequality that they did not want to deal with. Let's move now to a discussion of caste. What is caste and how are caste and class related? The concept of caste is uh, similar to that of class. A caste system involves levels of social hierarchy with those on top having better access to economic, cultural, and political power. But caste systems are entirely ascribed. That is, one is born into one's caste and there is no option to leave it. As we have seen, Changing one's class is not always as easy as we might want to believe, but in a caste system, both upward and downward mobility are not allowed. Caste in India. The caste system found in the nation of India is among the best known examples in the world. This caste system has been officially outlawed since the mid 20th century, yet its influence endures. India's caste system arose in part out of Hindu religious traditions based on traditional texts, rituals, and beliefs. 
Those traditions defined four castes along with appropriate roles for members of each caste to play. The Brahmin caste was for scholars and spiritual leaders. The Kshatriya class was for soldiers and rulers. The Vaishya caste was for agricultural workers and merchants. And the Shudra caste was for laborers and artisans. Members of each caste were seen as born into these roles, and they could not change these roles during their lifetime. Only through religious devotion could one hope to move up in castes when reincarnated into the next life. In addition to the four castes, there were the Dalits, the outcasts or untouchables. These were people who were born without a caste and were thus considered to be the most impure and lowest people of all India. These individuals were forced to take the hardest and dirtiest jobs and given no means to escape their status. India's caste system was widely exploited by the British during the nation's colonial occupation. This pre-existing system of organization among the people made controlling the population easier for the British colonial administrators. They were able to place different caste members into appropriate professions and further abuse the um, untouchables. The prevalence of the caste system also further allowed the British to view Indians as different from themselves, thus casting their own British identity as more civilized and more advanced. While the caste system was abolished upon Indian in independence in the mid-20th century, structural inequalities continued to prevail. Former members of the Dalit class um, or caste continue to face discrimination. Most notably, they find they have a dearth of cultural capital. Their ancestors had next to no cultural capital to spend, thus making it all the more difficult for their children to advance. Progress toward equality is steady, but slow. What are the effects of global inequality? Uneven development is a central characteristic of the global capitalist system. 40% of the world's population lives in poverty, on an income of less than $2 per day. And one-sixth of the world's population lives in extreme poverty. And yet 2% of the world's population owns more than half of all wealth on the planet. The gap between rich and poor countries continues to widen, and even the poorest countries have an elite organized around political, economic, and or military power. Global inequality affects the life chances of the world's population in areas like hunger, health, education, vulnerability to climate change, and access to technology. This image shows territory size as the proportion of all gross national income in U.S. dollars that is attributed to that place. Gross national income is all income and profits received in a territory. Income is from goods and services produced in a ter territory plus income from abroad, excluded are profits made by foreign companies. The highest gross national incomes per person are in Western Europe, North America, and Japan, the lowest are in Burundi and Ethiopia. Of the total of gross national incomes worldwide, the United States has 33%, Western Europe 28%, and Japan 13%. Much is amassed by multinational companies whose profits can exceed the gross national income of some poor territories. The profits of multinationals are counted in the home territory of the owners, not where they are actually doing business. This concludes our lecture. Today we examined several questions surrounding class and inequality, including is inequality a natural part of human culture? How do anthropologists analyze class and inequality? How are class and inequality constructed in the United States? What are the roots of poverty in the United States? Why are class and inequality invisible in the US culture? What is caste and how are caste and class related? And what are the effects of global inequality?